On the road to recovery, Castle Rock, Colorado. Live from Millville, New Jersey, I'm on the road to recovery. We're on the road to recovery in Morgantown, West Virginia at Mountaineer Field. And live in Scranton, Pennsylvania, I'm on the road to recovery. Here I am on the road to recovery from Berlin, Maryland. Hey, from Caseville, Michigan, I'm on the road to recovery. I'm on the road to recovery at Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. So we're on the road to recovery, Weequay Park, Newark, New Jersey, Brick City. It was kind of bittersweet to come back here today and uh, interview someone that's so close and dear to me. Um, but I, I just, I'm very uh, excited and I'm glad I had a chance to, to share his story with you. Idris Rahman, a, a man that um, uh, overcomes so many things in his life. And to those who say it can't be done, you're always judged and defined by what you were and the labels that are put upon you. He's a shining example of proving that wrong. On the road to recovery from Newark, New Jersey with Idris. How you doing? My name is Idris Rahman. And I want to start out by one, just talking about the origins and the beginning of usage for me. I um, was born and raised in the city of Newark to a single parent household with uh, five other siblings. Came up during the 70s and I began using marijuana or smoking marijuana because I wanted to be accepted by a group that I identified as the cool group. So I started hanging with them and unfortunately, whatever behaviors that they were engaging in, I began to engage in them. And it started out with just marijuana. After marijuana, it, um, you know, pills started, the taking the pills and hanging out with the wrong crowd on a daily basis and became addicted to the pills. The pills that I'm talking about is uh, pills that was common in the city of Newark called Sebas and Codeines, or commonly referred to on the streets as hits. After the hits, um, I started messing with heroin. First time I tried heroin, I was in Rollway State Prison and someone came and gave me a bag, and I had been afraid of heroin, but it, when he handed it to me at that time, it seemed like it was the most natural thing to do, and I tried it. And there began the nightmare that I described today. Um, I used on and off for a better part of 25 years of my life, I tried multiple different um, drugs. So when asked what is my drug of choice, I oftentimes say, I'm not sure. I think that anything that I've used, um, would have been my choice for that moment. Um, so earlier I talked about the first time I tried heroin, I was in Rollway State Prison in Fort Wayne, on fire tier actually. I had been in prison at that point about seven to eight years, and I was looking at another uh, four or five years ago before ultimately being released. I was in prison for a host of different crimes, but na namely crimes that involved usage in one form or another, whether it was selling or using, or committing crimes to get more drugs, but primarily drugs was the root cause of all of my criminal involvement. And so over my lifetime, I spent over six years, of, uh, I'm sorry, 22 years of my life in prison. I was sentenced to prison six times. Um, it wasn't until about 12, 13 years ago that I decided to do something different and began to make some changes in my life that would make prison not a part of my future. Um, I went back to school, secured three college degrees. Um, as I stand today, I have a master's degree in social work, but I'm also presently pursuing a PhD. I'm at Weldon University, um, securing a PhD in human and social services. So I hope to one day, you know, start a program to be able to go back into the communities that I offended for far too long and help people try to overcome some of the obstacles that I had to overcome in life. Um, you all know that I do motivational speaking. I'll go all across this state trying to get the message out in hopes that I can help somebody else avoid some of the same mistakes that I made in my life. You know, thinking that you'll always be what you have been is a trick or a ploy used to keep you from advancing in life. That's just simply not true. And it's my message 
that I deliver on a daily basis is that with making good choices, with making developing some cognitive skills so that you are making the best choice, then what you have been does not mean that that's what you have to be. You have to understand, and I tell people all the time that just because you may have been an addict all your life, just because you may have been a crook or a thief all your life, that does not mean that you have to be that the remainder of your life. You can make changes in your life. It's up to you whether or not you remain the same. It is up to you whether or not you allow change to take course. But all I know is that in order to give change a chance, you must start first with giving yourself a chance. Because if you don't give yourself a chance, then change has no chance. Stop believing what people may tell you because the reality of it is that whatever the remainder of your life look like is entirely up to you. We must begin to do something different. And it has to start with us. We got to stop looking to the politicians. We got to stop looking to elected officials and say, this is the problem, now you fix it. And instead, we got to start fixing it. And it begins in our home. We can't just sit idly by and knowing the kids are smoking marijuana and be okay with that because you're telling yourself that it's just marijuana. Well, just marijuana leads to other drugs. And if you're okay with marijuana, trust me, there'll come a time when you're going to be forced to be okay with whatever else they're doing. Hey, uh, Rock, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm so grateful and uh, appreciative of your time, your inspiration, and all that you do for the community and for people. Um, you inspire me. You inspire so many people. I hope he's inspired you. On the road to recovery from Newark, New Jersey, I'm Michael DeLeon, and we'll see you on the next episode.